The X-Station is an optical drive emulator for the original PlayStation. It replaces the CD drive in certain models of PS1 with PU8 and PU18 motherboards. And we're going to do that right now. Mark fixes stuff. This video is sponsored by Altium. Altium Designer empowers you to create PCB designs with an intuitive and powerful interface, connecting you to every aspect of the electronics design process. With over 35 years of innovations, Altium Designer is the most widely used and trusted PCB design solution on Earth. Click the link below to claim your free trial and start your Altium Designer journey today. The X Station allows you to use a micro SD card full of game images in Series 1, 5, and some 7000 PlayStations. We're going to install this one in an SCPH5552 unit. There are six black outer screws. All of the outer screws on a PlayStation are black, and all the inner screws are gold. Moving around the base, we remove the six screws. This grey dust you're seeing is actually ground plastic, and evidence that someone has been in this machine before, cross-threading the screws on reassembly. With the case screws removed, we can take the top off of the PlayStation. Immediately, I can see a possible reason that this unit was marked as drive not spinning. The power cable for the laser is disconnected. We're replacing all of this, so let's just disconnect the drive ribbon cable and crack on. With the laser disconnected, we can lift it out of the way. We disconnect the power from the PSU. And also remove the ribbon cable from the controller board. There's four screws to remove from the top layer of the shielding. The screws for this layer are marked with arrows. With the final shielding screw removed, we can remove the tightly fitted top shield. Alas, there's yet more screwing to be done to get the board out of the case. To fit the X station, we'll need to access both sides of the console's motherboard. Luckily, all the screws in the PlayStation are of the same size and type. With the board finally free, we lift it out. The part we need to work on is underneath the copper shielding here. The chip at IC701 is a combined CD, DSP and digital servo for the CD drive. We need to lift a few pins as carefully as we can. Let's get this shielding out of the way first. The board isn't dirty, but it is home to a few dust bunnies that we'll need to evict. I'm using the conical tip on my iron today. We'll set the temperature to 330 degrees centigrade. I'm rotating the board to get a better angle to work on it. We'll start by lifting pin 80, and then we need to also lift pin 78, 77 and 74 on this corner of the chip. A small amount of flux paste really helps here. Using some fine tip tweezers, we add a little pressure to the pin whilst heating the pad and the pin at the same time. Although this leg is not needed, 
I want to keep it as intact as possible. I go for pin 77 next because that will give me a better angle on pin 78 as well. Pin 78 should be easy now. And there we go. These are rather small to the naked eye, so I lift them high to make sure they're properly disconnected. Pin 74 now, a single leg enclosed on both sides. Because the pins are so small, it can be hard to lift one without disturbing its neighbors. If this happens, it can be easily rectified, so don't worry. It looks messy this close up, but we'll come back and we'll tidy it soon. Now for pin 56, another single pin. Again, a small amount of leverage on the pin and we bring in the soldering iron. And there we go, we've pulled out an extra leg. Trying to heat it back onto the pad won't work now, so we'll need to add a bit more solder. Let's move 56 out of the way first and clean up that empty pad. And with our extra leg shoved back into position, we can add a bit of solder. This solder is only 0.7 millimeters thick. It looks massive here. Repaired, and a nice solid joint too. 80, 78, 77, 74, and 76 are lifted. So we need to move to the next side of the chip. More funky flux paste. And we lift 45, 46 and 47 in one go by heating the pins with the side of the iron. We need to clean up the empty pads to make sure that they're not bridged. With the pads cleaned and checked, I make double sure that none of the neighboring pins have been accidentally desoldered and are still stuck down firm. We then clean down the board with a cotton bud soaked in IPA. We can't leave those legs in the air, so we'll insulate the board with polyamide tape and push them gently down again. Taking care that they're straight and not shorting any other pins of course. Now this side. And done. With the legs lifted on IC701, we need to turn our attention to the other side of the board. Oh ho ho, we have a piratey little guest. This mod chip will need to be removed. We'll just melt the solder and clean up the points with some solder wick and flux. What's hiding in here? It's a 12C508A pick chip with a full wire install. Not really sure what this might be. Maybe a later MM3 version? A quick clean up before we proceed. We don't want any lumps or bumps or anything that might be located underneath our add-on PCB. I won't film cleaning up all the points though. Let's clean the area with isopropyl alcohol before we get to the actual install. Inside the X-Station box we have a few parts. The X-Station board itself that sits in place of the CD drive. A couple of really nice stickers. and the solder installation parts. 
These nylon standoffs are to keep the X station board at the right height in the drive bay. This QSB is for the 1000 series PlayStations and we don't need this in this console. This is the QSB that we need to mount on the underside of our board. Quick solder boards make installation a lot easier and do away with the need for dozens of wires. The QSB locates over the main board like this and installs with a few blobs of solder. Then the QSB is simply connected via this ribbon cable to the main board which replaces the optical drive. A bit more cleaning where the QSB will be attached. And we can position the board. I'll solder the topmost point first. This will allow us a small amount of gentle movement to get the other points aligned. With QSBs, you sometimes have to break the rules a little and use the solder itself to heat the pad in QSB contacts. Gently find the right position for the board. It doesn't need to be super precise, but the closer the better. There are two points of the motherboard that need to be prepared for soldering. I do this with the QSB in place so that I can see the exact points. Then it's a quick case of scraping the point gently with a sharp tool like a scalpel. Afterwards, a quick wipe with IPA on a cotton bud. If you use liquid flux on a QSB, it can run underneath the board and be harder to clean afterwards. I usually use flux paste for these, but this is a good demonstration. We can now move around the board, soldering the points. This is an extreme close-up, so the solder points look a bit like massive blobs, but the connections are good. With the holes in the middle of the QSB, I tend to put the solder into the hole and then melt it to fill it like a bucket. Luckily, solder is attracted to the pads and with the aid of the flux core in the solder, it's very difficult to overfill the connections or otherwise get it wrong. These boards make installations very simple. So, that's the QSB installed. All the points are soldered, and we just need to add a single wire to the round APLL pad on the board. The point we're connecting to is over by this oscillator. We also have to remove this 220 ohm resistor. Just a tiny dab of flux paste. Then by gently heating the length of the whole resistor, it comes off the board really easily. And we clean up the sticky mess that we left after we took it out. We need to solder this point here to the APLL point here. Happily, all these points are joined together so we can solder to all of them for extra strength. With modifications, it's a good idea to keep any wires as short as possible to prevent any timing delays or introducing stray capacitance into the circuit. And with the wire installed, that's the hard part finished. we've lifted and separated the legs of the chip and installed our QSB. Now it's time to put it all back together. But there's a problem. 
When our flat cable is installed and routed out of the socket on our quick solder board, it will be trapped by this plastic post. And that won't do. Snip snip. We just need to remove the support and flatten the area. Time to reassemble. We need to install the flat cable into the locking socket on the QSB next. Unlock it by sliding the collar open. Then place the cable blue side up into the socket, finally snapping the collar shut. Place the PlayStation board back into the case. We need to reinstall the shield, but unfortunately it's lost its tackiness. We'll use some Kapton tape to hold it in place. We could use any tape really, but I really like the colour of the polyamide. Screwing the main board down now. Internal screws are marked with arrows to help reassembly. There's two here, so don't miss one out like I usually do. Always remember to rotate screws anti-clockwise until they drop into the existing thread to avoid stripping the screw holes. To avoid trapping and severing the flat cable, we have to make sure it's passed through this slot in the upper shielding. With the cable routed correctly, push the shield down into position and start screwing. Again, look for the arrows as a guide. Now we can add the X station board itself. The board looks really good in its black finish and is really easy to hook up. It fits over these brass pins, but needs the nylon supports to keep it level. They simply snap in. Push it in until it snaps. And don't forget to push your third leg in before you finish. The X station now sits flat so we can route the flex cable to the front socket. The best way to do this is with two 45 degree folds. The first fold flattens the cable down behind the front bronze post. And the second fold brings the cable down the left hand side of the same post in the perfect position to connect to the X station socket. The socket is the same as on the QSB. The cable keeps pushing the X station up, so a bit more capped on tape and a tiny blob of super glue gel will keep it in place for now. Don't forget to plug the controller and memory card board back in. Or the cable from the PSU. The top shell can now be replaced as well. And screw back together. I hope you're enjoying this video and finding it helpful. 
Markfix's stuff is driven by its kind patrons, who enjoy ad-free early access to all my content, as well as exclusive patron-only videos and their own Discord channel. If you'd like to help support the channel, simply visit patreon.com forward slash Markfix's stuff. Let's prepare the SD card. The XStation software can be found on their GitHub page. We need their latest version of the firmware and loader. They come bundled together. Download the latest update file and when it's finished downloading, it needs to be unzipped into a folder called 00XStation in the root of your SD card. All your game images are simply dropped into folders. Now, I only have a composite cable to hand, but I can show you a common complaint I hear from PAL TV users. Let's connect up to the TV so that I can show you the problem. By the way, I'm using an Integral branded 256GB card from Amazon. It seems to work fine and comes pre-formatted as FAT32. Let's power on. The PlayStation boots and the custom code executes on the X station instead of being read from a disc. This screen means a successful boot and that the menu code is loading. When you first boot with a new SD card, or if you add games to the card, then you'll need to scan the card for titles. Simply press triangle to enter the menu where the refresh option is located. There are a few options in here, but they're well named and self-explanatory. I'm pretty happy to get rid of this eyeball melting blue though. This update firmware item will read the latest firmware out of the bundle of files you put into the 00x station folder, but I've already done this. So let's go ahead and refresh the games list. It's pretty quick with a few games, but may take longer with a fuller card. Now let me show you why you need an RGB SCART cable to play US games at 60Hz on PAL TVs. Composite and S-Video derive their color timing for the image from an onboard crystal on the motherboard. Now this machine has a PAL crystal and therefore the wrong colour timing is producing this rainbow effect on US games. This is a limitation of machines before the 7000 series. RGB output does not need this timing, so the fix is to get an RGB cable and enjoy a better picture all around. The X station is great and really drags the PlayStation kicking and screaming into the century of the fruit bat. I'd like to say a massive thanks to my patrons appearing on the screen right now. These people are amazing and help me to produce content like this video. If you'd like to become a patron, visit patreon.com forward slash stuff. Thank you all so much for your amazing support. Come and watch my other videos now. Please. Pretty please. Oh, come on. Bye.